Okay, so we had stopped here with the lovable madman just in the second dying 574 right here. And I speculated at the end that there'd be seven after him, but it really weren't. So let's go over more what seven is here. They're all amazed at the beast that was, but is no longer, but will come. And John reserves the words will come for the guy who's trying to make it come, Justinian the first. And he's trying so much to make it come that he makes a revolt of the Nika come with a brutal put down of killing 30,000 people. So he comes back to power that that way. But what comes in its wake is bad weather, cold famine, da da da. Okay, and after that, plagues, which everybody started calling the plague of Justinian. Okay? Then there's the Beirut earthquake. And then two years after the Beirut earthquake, what does he do? Did he learn his lesson? No. He says that whatever he says is what church is supposed to rule. Whatever doctrine, whatever Bibles, whatever teaching, whatever liturgy, whatever positions, requires Justinian one's command or approval. That is as harlotty as it gets. And he's on the seven hills. He is on the seven hills. But when he dies, he's not upon them anymore. Okay? So, and the seven, it says, and the seven heads are seven hills where the woman is sitting on them. The woman is the religion. And Justinian decided that he was going to husband that religion and all the clerics and everybody else, whatever they thought of Bible, wasn't going to count, only what he ruled. Which is flat blasphemy. Okay, so he's not upon her anymore. He's not upon the religion anymore. He's dead. Right here. He's dead. And there will be seven kings. So seven mountains means the location, okay, but it means Rome, but it means prototype Rome because the Rome here doesn't exist anymore. He was trying to bring it back. The only thing he had in common was that he had seven hills and they were still calling themselves Rome. Okay, but do you know how many empires have tried to call themselves Rome revivified since Justinian? A bunch. We're going to meet a couple of them before I get to the end of Revelation 17. As late as Hitler in the 1930s was calling for the revival of the Roman Empire over his area. Well, that's not the same territory as Justinian's. That would have been closer to the West, which also called itself the Roman Empire, starting with the guy we're going to meet very soon, Charlemagne. Charlemagne thought he was the new Rome. So then what is Rome? It's an idea. It's an idea that unifies church and state. It's a harlotty idea. The woman sitting on the beast full of blasphemous names. Remember all of her nasty names? Fake Church, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Okay, well, a lot of harlots can go to a lot of different places. They don't all have to be in the same geographical place. And that's what's been wrong with Christian scholarship all this time. He keeps thinking, oh, it must be a revivification of Italy. No. Because Byzantium wasn't And what will be later called the Holy Roman Empire wasn't. 
And what Hitler was trying to do wasn't, and before Hitler it was Napoleon who was trying to create a new Rome, but not in Rome. It's the idea. So if China turns around tomorrow and says it wants to be the new Rome, well, that's another harlot. You know, when you're a harlot, you travel a lot. You can't stay in the same block for too long because you use up all your customers, so you got to go to new ground. So there's a traveling harlot of religion with all of its apostasies and abominations. There's no greater harlotry than religion. And the Bible starts that story very early, starting with what? The Temple of Babel, the Ziggurat of Babel which becomes Babylon, see, Babel, is in the plain of Shinar, which is a nickname for what we call Babylon, that is an archaeological fact, it wasn't known for a long time that that's where the Tower of Babel was, but they did find one, it wasn't the original one, it was one that, I want to say Nebuchadnezzar in who was running Babylon at the time tried to reconstruct he was a lot older than him but he thought that was the original Tower of Babel and it was in his territory which he called Babylon okay you getting that harlotry okay so Babylon can be anywhere it's an idea it's a form of uniting church and state. So Babylon is a nickname used. Fake church is a nickname used. So it's a blending of church, which is fake doctrine, false doctrine, using the Bible, using Jesus' name to do it, and the ancient Babylonian idea of uniting church and state, turning into all kinds of new harlotries. Israel was called a harlot. Harlot is when you're going away from God, but in the name of God. And that's an abomination if ever there was one. Something that you put in a holy place that shouldn't be there. Technically speaking. That's the way Daniel uses it in Daniel 9, 27. Okay? That's what Christ was warning about. Alright? So it doesn't have to be the territory that's the same as ancient Italy's territory. And you can't really say that because where did Rome go? Rome had a lot of different boundaries and territories throughout its lifetime. So all these people saying, oh, we're going to see the ten nation European confederacy come out here. And it's going to eventually be seven kings instead of ten out of Europe. Huh? You do that, honey, and you're going to miss the real the real problem when it comes. And if you're so stupid that you're going to say that, then maybe you're not even saved. So believe Jesus Christ paid for your sins, so you'll be sure not to be here when it happens. But it's got a lot broader application right here, and we know that from the meter. We know that from the examples of the history benchmarks in the meter. We first saw it with Constantine, and that wasn't even Italy. That was New Rome and Istanbul. So if you're going to talk about geography, the formation, when this first name gets first used, is Constantine. And it's not in Italy. It's in what we call Istanbul. So you can't even really say that it's Catholic. It might be Chrislam, it might be some other religion that touts Christ as one of its votaries or one of its members. You know, there are a whole bunch of them that do. Practically every religion on the planet claims Christ as one of their holy people. Grandeur does. Okay? So get your head out of the get your head out of the, the box and look up. New Rome is not in Italy. <coughs> that is where the harlot names first used. It's not used of Italy. Doesn't mean it isn't Italy. Doesn't mean it can't be Italy. But it can be anywhere. It can be the United States. And the people who are around Trump now call themselves, call themselves, seven 
mountains. They're trying to bring about a new Rome with the United States as they had. They reverse the meaning of Revelation 17. They think that they'll bring Christ back if they take over the seven big mountains of rulership like communications and business and the White House. They just got the White House for the first time. They've been trying for 56 years to get it. Yeah. And in 50, 56, 5, 56 AD, three years after Justinian claimed to be the ruler of the world, so much that anything about church was subject to his command. What do you think those Seven Mountains people around Trump are trying to do? The same thing. They think they got a patsy in Trump. That's why they don't care how immoral he is. That's why they don't care how he's bankrupted his casinos. How do you bankrupt a casino? That's why they don't care how obstreperous and nasty and stupid and bad the man is. For 30 years we have public records of how bad this man is. I mean, more than anybody I've ever seen in history, we have total public record of how bad he is. Whether he'd run for office or not, it's just a question of calling up the records. He advertises how bad he is. He likes to be bad. It makes him feel good to cheat people. He does it over and over and over again. And he's been doing it since the 1980s, so it's not like we can't tell. He brags about how he cheats people. He bragged to Chris Matthews. Chris Matthews did a series on him called Citizen Trump that you can watch at CSNBC, you know, video site. Okay? And if you don't have it, I'll send you the links. He bragged about cheating the bankers for his first hotel that he tried to build in Atlantic City. Bragged about it. In his own words, you see him brag. He's telling Chris Matthews how he, how he fooled the bankers. How he cheated them. He's bragging about it. Now, honey, that's telling Chris Matthews. Bragging about cheating somebody else. Okay? So, if you're bragging about cheating somebody, you don't have a moral compass. And Justinian didn't have one either. And the people supporting Trump don't have one either. Because... There are seven mountains, and they totally reverse Revelation, which is obviously here in this context. See, mother of harlots. Seven mountains, nickname for Rome, always was the nickname for Rome. And these people today around Trump call themselves seven mountains. And it's ticked, it's matched to the very year that Justinian took command over the church that okay well you everything you teach about Bible I have to approve it that has never ever been in history before not even Constantine did that Justinian is the worst of them okay the worst of them and like I said you can just go look this up see here's Justinian link where do you think I learned it from? And here's Justinian. Go look it up on the internet. Here's the year in which he passed that decree. Seven Mountains is reserved for that time. That tells you a lot about, and of course it's already in Daniel 11. Okay? Con Justinian I went farther than everybody to date to come up with that kind of ruling in 553. That was part of the Justinian Code that all the idiots praise. There's nothing praiseworthy in that code. It's sheer drivel, for one thing. And it's sheer anti-Semitism, for another thing. And it's sheer just tyranny, for another thing. And if anything, it's harlot personified. You want to know what the harlot looks like in the tribulation? Look no farther than Justinian. But the Bible will take you farther than Justinian because there's another guy coming after Justinian who everybody also admires, like Constantine. Only well, he's even worse. And that, it hurts for me to say that because I really like this last guy. 
but just any in dice here. All right. Then there's a sort of interlude with you know musical chair emperors, and there's a guy named Tiberius, and then there's a guy named Maurice. Okay, Maurice makes an alignment with the Italy Church in order to halt the Lombards who were invading Italy at that time. It doesn't work, and it doesn't last. But see, Justinian started that. Justinian II tried to keep it going, but Justinian I so bankrupted the Byzant Byzantium Empire that Justin II couldn't, and then you had Tiberius, and now you have Maurice, and they're trying to just get the Byzanti Byzantium solvent again. And for this section, it says, and there'll be seven kings, that's in the future. You can argue in some way that there were seven possible claimants during that time, but I don't think that's the point of it. Five of which have fallen. See, there are seven kings, but five are fallen. So it's not seven kings future, it's seven kings total. And who are the five fallen? And when you just, it's so easy to know the answer to this. And stupid scholars think, oh, well, who are the, what five past Roman kings? No, it's not talking about that. The whole passage is in light of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Just like what Christ was saying in Matthew 24, which Revelation 17 updates. See, Matthew 24 and 25 is a prophecy over the same period. And it's the first glimpse we have of the future fall of church. The warnings that Christ gives. And then <clears throat> Luke elaborates on it in Luke 21 tagging specific sections in Matthew so that you know that it's, you know, elaborative, just like Revelation is tagging here. Ephesians, Luke tags Matthew. I've already done those videos. Okay, and the same kind of tagging style is done by Luke to Matthew. Okay, so you can see the elaboration on it. And then Mark does the same thing, tagging Luke and Matthew which I'm in the middle of posting the videos on that, which by the time you see this video, you'll probably be done with those. Okay, so it shouldn't be a big shock when you read Daniel 2 and 7. Five have fallen. They're not five kings from the Roman Empire. They're five prototypes that were trying to do the same thing Rome was trying to do. And the first is obviously Babylon, because it's by name. And that was the head of gold in Daniel 2. That's how Daniel got to be an advisor to Nebuchadnezzar. He could interpret the dream. And the head was Babylon first. After that, in Daniel 2, you have the chest of bronze, of, of silver. That's Persia. After that, the thigh and legs of bronze. That was Greece. And it was identified. Each one of these were identified by name by the time you get to the end of Daniel. By the time you get through the book. Okay. And the last one was the feet of clay. Iron and clay. Alright. We find out here in Revelation, although it was first bracketed, uh, using a style of discourse called anaphora in Matthew 24, which Paul picked up and circled on in Ephesians 1. And in the same year, Luke 21 did the same thing in a different way. And Mark 13 did it very pointedly for the Byzantine Empire to show the cont cont contiguity of iron and clay mixed. It's always Rome. That's what Daniel knew. That's what Daniel foretold, was foretold. And that's what Daniel reiterates in his metered reply. His metered prayer to God to rebuild the temple in Daniel 9. He reconstructs the entire timeline of all Israel's kings, which was forecast by, Mose uh, by Isaiah year by year from first David to last David. Every syllable, one year, forecast every single year of all those kings in Isaiah 53. It's an annual prophecy that works exactly the same way you're seeing here in the Greek, only it's in Hebrew. And then Daniel recounts the Isaiah 53 
satire. Using his own satire, recapping what Isaiah said, and then benchmarking from Isaiah into the man of time in Daniel 2. Now, how do you prove all that? Well, I did videos on it so you can see the proof. Daniel 9 in particular is better a better place to start because you can see how he handles Isaiah 53. Plus, I did the Isaiah 53 videos. So you got Daniel 9 meter in Vimeo, that's a channel name. And you got Isaiah 53 also in Vimeo, that's a channel name. And you can go through those videos and, you know, you're a glutton for punishment if you do. But I did document what I'm telling you already, years ago. Okay, about eight years ago. All right. So it's no big to understand how the five fallen are empires, each of which had its own king. Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, and then Rome. But Rome keeps on going because people keep trying to revive it. And the poster boy presented here as the harlot, ding, 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 is occurring at Constantine when he rises to power right here and upon her forehead names were written these are names of Constantine's empire fake church Babylon the great mother of harlots and of all the blasphemies or all the abominations literally of the earth something put in a holy place that isn't at all holy is the opposite of holy and that is characterizing Constantine himself at death in the middle of abomination. He dies in abomination, which is even worse than the way Paul depicted him as dying midway through first fruit, so he isn't a first fruit. I'm not sure he was saved. He might have been. But nobody understood the gospel rightly in those days, so I'm not sure. I'm hoping so. I'd have to read a lot of what he wrote, and I'm not sure what he wrote is actually what he wrote, because Eusebius is such a liar. All right? But this guy is going is doing Constantine one farther. Constantine never made a rule that said, Hi, everything I say is, 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 is you know, church is bound to obey it. Constantine never did that. The Ostrogoth rulers never did that when they were ruling over Italy during this, this interim period. Okay? The Visigoths were in Spain and they never did that. In fact, they were pretty, they were pagans. They didn't start to get bad until they took, converted to Catholicism. And then they started persecuting the Jews almost immediately. But that's in the future, relative to this. It's only Justinian. If you want a prototype for the Antichrist, it's Justinian. And you just know he didn't get up in the morning and say, gee, I'd like to blaspheme God today. But that's exactly what he did. This is, you, you can't call this anything but a blasphemy. I dictate to church. Okay. Well, what's a pope? Same thing. What's the Seven Mountains movement behind Trump right now? Same thing. They want to rule their version of Christianity upon everybody. It can't be more evil than what we're going through right now except for this. And they would love it if they had that kind of authority and power. And they think that Trump is a, you know, a pawn in their hands. I think they're wrong. I think he's, he's bad, but... I don't think he let them get away with it, but you never know, because Satan's controlling this whole thing. Honey, if you reverse the meaning of Revelation 17 to say that seven mountains is going to bring back the coming of Christ, and therefore you're holy, something's wrong with you. So people behind Trump are far more evil than him, and that's saying something. So Justinian dies, and now we go through a sort of interregnum. And the five empires, therefore, they're empires, not kings. They're kings of empires. Are Babylon, Persia, Greece, and postal boy Constantine for Rome. And, just newly died, Justinian. Because they all want united church and state. You can't call pagan Rome 
You can't involve pagan Rome in this, although the word Rome was used in Rome took over while it was pagan, you know, to the people of the prince that'll come. Okay, but the people of the prince that'll come is what people? The people who think the same way. Rome was always an idea. It happened to have one physical location in Italy. It now has a different physical location in Byzantium. And the guy who embodied it the most has just died right here. He's not upon anything. So now Maurice is in his place. So five have fallen, including Justinian. And one is. Well, Maurice is. See, if you know the meter, you get an entirely different perspective on it, and it's much more tactile, much more specific, much clearer what he's talking about. And it's not, it's not fuzzy. There's no fuzziness. Okay, it's certainly not allegorical, as you can see. It's very literal. But it's done in constant parallelism to events upcoming versus events that are coming in the official tribulation. And theology has known about that for a long time. They call it dual fulfillment, or near fulfillment and far fulfillment. That every prophecy God gives has a near fulfillment to be an example of the far fulfillment that's coming later. Well, that's what this is. Same story as all the Old Testament prophets were, the prophecies were the same way. Okay, it's the same style, same meaning, same idea, but different person. So one is, at the moment, 496 years from when John writes, that, that person going to be Maurice. And what's so cute about this is that, again, John is playing a game with 490 plus 6. 88 AD, at the end of it, is 6 years from when the millennium was supposed to start. So he's focusing and stressing the fact that he's writing a year late. Because everybody knew the 490 doctrine who got this. We don't know it now because our parents didn't pass it on to their kids and their kids and their kids. But it's very obvious the number here. See, we've been tracking this now since up here. He's doing different kind of reconciliations to 490. Okay? And so now he's doing it again. Okay, now he's tallying to, for the sake of Jews, because he's a Jew, Hi, you know doggone well that the next 490 is supposed to start six years from when I write. Okay, so now I'm writing about what's going to happen 490 years after that, but that's dual entendre, because he's already writing 88 years before the 490, you know, when the 490 began for church, so now you have to add 88 years to that again, and you get 584. Because he's writing about something that's going to happen 496 years from when he writes. Okay? And he's writing, in, he's writing 88 years into a new 490. So on the one hand, he's, it's evocative of the old 490. And on the other hand, it's evocative of the new one. Okay? So at the end of 584, when we should have already been in heaven for 490 years, there's this guy named Maurice. Of course, you know, until you actually get to Ho Eisesten, you don't know his name. And he's going to use church to halt, halt the Lombards. Okay? So he's making a deal with the devil. He's making a deal with the woman. Okay? And he is. Okay, down here, again, he's reconciling. Because, remember, he's, he's, he's tagging prior writ that uses these same, these same benchmarks. And now we get to the end of what we would have to call 591 AD. But that's really 490 plus 70. And the 490 is after 30, because that's the way they're benchmarking works in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13, because Christ is speaking in 30 AD. So now that's 490 would be 520, after 520 is 590. So he's benchmarking that. So he's benchmarking ahead, and he's benchmarking sort of like backwards as far as the, the, the numbers go, but the time is always going forward also. 
In other words, this is this was the way people track their numbers, and you still do that today. Hi, it's been two thousand bloody blah years since the temple went down, and of course their calendars all screwed up. So always years from. It's years from one one number versus years from another number, Ver years from Christ's birth or years from Christ's death. And it's it's reconciling. It's always reconciling to one set of books or another set of books. Okay, so then it says, and others will come. Others have not yet come. Okay, yeah, the others have not yet come. The other one has not yet come. Yeah, because five five ninety one. That's the start of the new four four ninety after the voting period. That's a four ninety measure from the cross. And in five ninety, there's a there's a sort of like. Minor musical chairs, one emperor and another for a little while and a little while and a little while. Okay, but what this is introducing, obviously, is a kind of intermission. And there is an intermission. But the biggest thing about it, see where it says beast here? Okay. Our boy Mohammed. Not at all related to Christianity. He starts his ministry right at Hull. Okay, so I really ought to do that because they, they consider him to be like a king. Okay, and so he's a Hull. But you notice he's not a Kai because he's not a king. Okay, and this is the beast who. See, he wants to be a beast. He wants to take over. And in 610, 610, just before Ain, because he's not a was, he's a gonna be, he starts his ministry to telling everybody, hi, oh, I got this latest update on the Bible, and the Bible's corrupt. And Actually, he, doesn't, he never says that. The Quran does not say the Bible is corrupt. Quran says that people's understanding of the Bible is corrupt, which was true. Okay, and he starts his little ministry there. And for the first time, the pagan, polytheistic uh, Arabs, they, they get a monotheism going. Now, what's so funny about that is his closest writer guy, okay, the guy who wrote down for him, was a Christian. There's a lot of little jokes in here about his book and the Quran is a really funny book I don't believe for a second that it was written by a human being because <clears throat> it makes all kinds of plays on um, Hebrew roots Hebrew roots are usually in three letters and a lot of the surahs begin with Hebrew roots because Arabic's a lot like Hebrew and one of these days if I live long enough I'm going to want to go through the Quran and, and show you just how witty it is it's extremely witty I don't believe that a human being can be that witty. So I do believe he got a dictation, but he got it from a demon. Okay. But the point is, is that he rises during this time at Hull. And that's being predicted here. Okay. He's a Hull. He wants to be a beast too. But he's not. He's just a pronoun. <laughs> that's why it's funny. Okay, but at least he's not a Kai, all right? So, and is not, yeah. By 615 A.D., both Byzantine and Persia exhaust each other in fighting with each other that they've been doing for over 100 years. In Jerusalem, Persia temporarily wins, but Persia is not doing anything about it. Persia is not able to fight. Persia is not able to defend itself. So the Jews start saying to Persia, well, okay, but we are in desiring of a new temple. Build us a new temple. Or we'll build a new temple. Let us build a new temple. Because we hate the Byzantines and they, they help Persia win. And Byzantines, of course, know that. And they want a new temple. So the temple is not. You get that with. Okay. I don't know how to say all that. And put it into words here. That I could just put in purple. 
Persia is not able to fight anymore. Byzantine is not Byzantium is not able to fight anymore in those years. Okay? There is not a temple in Jerusalem, but they want one to be, so they want to get it built. So they go to the Kai, the king of Persia, and they try to get one, but they don't get an answer yes. And sooner or later, Byzantine is very, the Byzantine Empire is very upset about the fact that they lost to Persia. So they start to fight again. Okay. But in between, because we got this, we got this new guy now. Okay. All right. The uh, the other one hasn't yet come, and when he comes, he must stay for a little while. Only gone a little while. He must stay. Okay. And the beast that was, and is not, because the beast that was is Byzantine and and Persia. They're both exhausted, and they're not. They are, and they're not. They're they are in existence. But they're not really have any power right now. They're just licking their wounds. Okay. And is not. Yeah. They're not in really any control. During that time comes an eighth. Now you'll notice that our boy, the angel, he, he didn't have to word it like this. But when you word it like this, there's a Greek rule called hiatus. It says you have to run the syllable, they have to run the sound together. And by doing that, he gets his five syllables to cover the word five. So now he plays that trick again when he does Ogdos. Ogdos. Okay, to make it be eight. And the ho, the tear, is in only the Sinai manuscript and one other one. Okay, but it's not in any other Sinai manuscripts and it's not in any other manuscripts. And since he wants his syllable count to be eight, that whole doesn't exist. Kai altas ogdos says. See, it's it's cute. Kai altos ogdos says. See, because see, it's hoi pente. There's no def. You know, they are five. Okay, this is singular. Okay, you don't have to say the eight. You've already got the word autos here. This classical Greek. You don't need the whole. Okay? The eighth is so that you can get his eight syllables. Now, at S. S then means it is, he is. At S, that's 622 AD. And what do the Muslims call that? Their Hegira. That's when they leave Mecca and go to Medina. And that's their exodus. And the entire Quran is built around the exodus. And what's even scarier still is that when you look at history, every time the Muslims swarm, it's approximately 430 years, which is what the book of Exodus 12, 40 and 41 says was the length of time that Jacob had been, Jacob and his progeny, had been in Egypt at the time they leave. If that isn't proof that the Quran has got a demon origin, I don't know what is. Because the history plays out, as it were, on clockwork to time a sort of, what do you want to call it? A Muslim competition of an exodus with exodus. That's actual history. The historical years are 638, 1071, or 1073, uh, 1517, and 1941, or 1947. Okay? Bible uses both dates. Those are actual historical dates of war of Muslims swarming into Jerusalem. So what do you think? Alright, so how am I going to depict that? Well, I can do Estin here and do that and that. That's about all I can do. It's an S rather than an X, but it still come, you know, says the same thing. So now where are we? Well, I think I'm going to take another break and we'll come back.